In the weather today, a strong Pacific impulse launches through the southwest, and atmospheric rivers will begin surging into the Pacific Northwest this evening. We'll cover that shortly. Temperature extremes around the world. Well, the hot spot was in Mozambique. That's going to be the town of Tete. It was 110 degrees there, and that does look pretty dusty, a little bit like Southern California. And at the other extreme in Siberia, La Baznaya, minus 43 degrees Fahrenheit. This whole area, this mountainous region, has a lot of valleys where cold air tends to get trapped. And this particular town, well, there's nothing there. I can't find a single image, but yeah, that's the characteristic Siberian mountain valley. Closer to home, here's what the weather map looked like early this afternoon. We've got some cold air on the east coast, but it's already on the way out. Kind of a short wavelength progression to these different weather systems. Warm air filtering into the western Great Lakes. Temperatures coming up to 40 degrees, and we're expecting 50s in the Dakotas. Even 60 degrees forecast today for Goodland, Kansas. Ridging across the southeastern U.S., it was a cold morning. Elizabeth City, North Carolina, somewhere up in that area, they were down to 22 degrees this morning, breaking their record. And we're expecting another cold evening tonight. And there's trouble coming in from California. That's mostly an upper-level system. We don't see a whole lot of reflection of that in the lower levels. But shortly, I'll take you up to the upper levels, and we'll get a look at that. So we're going to go from this outbound cold air, using our 4D sounding, and we're going to work our way towards the west. So let's get started. So this is our cross section. This is increasing height, so this is going to be up at about 50,000 feet. And down here is the surface. In fact, you can see the mountains of Nova Scotia right there. Always refer to that inset map. That blue line indicates what we're looking at. So down here, just off the Bahamas, you can see that blue there. That's some of the tropical moisture. The grays indicate higher relative humidity, so that kind of corresponds to clouds. And the north part of that line, that's up there in Quebec. So what do we see here? Let's go inland just a little bit towards New York City. And you can see that upper level jet across Florida and Georgia. So now we're about over New York. Notice that these lines down here under 850 millibars, in other words, from surface up to 5,000, they are vertical. And that's indicating a lot of modification of the cold air mass. If we go to pivotal weather and look at a sounding along the coast there, you're going to see steep lapse rates right there from the surface up to 850. That's where we have very cold air flooding the region, but it's being heated from the bottom up like that. So we're infusing it with warmth from below. And if that wasn't happening, if we had the surface all coated with aluminum foil, maybe thousands of square miles of aluminum foil, we would have temperatures at the surface of maybe minus 5 to minus 10 Celsius, about maybe 10 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So air mass modification taking place all the way down towards Florida. That cold air has made it pretty far south. And looks like kind of a, another upper level boundary right there. The isentropes start tilting in the mid-levels. So that's a little bit of an upper level disturbance progressing through that area. So now we're moving west into the central U.S. Just more cold air and modification taking place there as well. And it becomes more of an inversion from about five to 10,000 feet. Then we start to pick up some upper level moisture. Let's keep going, move out to Texas and the Great Plains. Cold air on its way out there as well. And as we get out towards the Rockies, here's those mountains starting to pop up there. And we can see trapped cold air in the valleys, forming very shallow inversions. And anywhere in those areas, there's fog and stratus, not very well depicted by the cloud forms because that's very close to the ground. Then going out into the Great Basin area, we start picking up that Pacific system. Look at the isentropes up here, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000. You're going to see them really start to steepen right there. 
See that right there? That's that upper level disturbance located about over Yuma. And you can see it really tightens up right here. And that's some strong mid-level energy moving across the southwestern U.S. And down below you can see the marine layer. That's Pacific air sitting out there off of Baja, California. Got a little bit of moisture to that. So there's that frontal system in the mid-levels. We're going to look at that on a different chart. And then we get back further west into some of the strong jet stream energy on the backside. So that is the Grand Tour. If we go up to the 700 millibar chart, about 10,000 feet up, we can pick up that frontal system right there over northern Baja California to Los Angeles, San Diego. You can see that gradient. And of course, that means that the front is going to be further south, right in that area there, and maybe a warm front section about like that. And as we roll the chart forward into this evening, you can see it moving eastward into the El Paso area for around midnight. And then by tomorrow morning into the following day, we'll go all the way into tomorrow evening, looks like that's made it all the way into Texas. And that will be associated with some severe weather out there in the southeastern part of the state. And another way we can track that disturbance is on the 500 millibar heights and vorticity. The vorticity indicated by the shading, that's positive vorticity or cyclonic vorticity. And we bring that up to midday, that's about the time of the surface analysis, and then this evening. So rapidly moving to the east, most of the strong dynamics where we have the lift out ahead of the cyclonic vorticity, this is an area of PVA or cyclonic vorticity advection, that's over southern Arizona. And then going into tomorrow, that's going to be morning, strong dynamics into the El Paso area, and then rolling out onto the plains and into the I-35 to the Arklatex area for tomorrow evening. So that's going to be the strong shortwave and the strong dynamics out ahead of that shortwave. In fact, that's probably the left front quadrant of the jet running about like that. And that's the left front quadrant, the jet max itself, right in there. And this will be a highly dynamic weather system looking at the one kilometer wind field. Check out Mexico down here by tomorrow morning. Starting to see some 70 knot flow across the mountains. And that is a setup for moderate to severe turbulence. And you can see as the day progresses, the low-level jet increases from 40 knots up to as high as 50 to maybe even 60 knots across the lower Mississippi River area. The main problem is that the air mass is in the process of recovering, still very dry today, so this very fast-moving system does not allow much time for recovery. So by the time we get up to the peak heating for tomorrow, you can see we've got this gradient from drier air up to the north to moist air along the Texas coast. And that will tend to limit the effects. Remember the dynamics are coming out like this, the left front quadrant working on this somewhat moisture depleted area to the north. So the dynamics are not really all that in phase with the moisture. So that will be a problem for tomorrow. And the other problem looking at the temperatures Remember the jet axis about like that, left front quadrant dynamics up here, and look at those temperatures. At peak heating, 21Z tomorrow, 50s. So that is going to be elevated for sure. The warm front, that is going to run from about Abilene, maybe through Hillsboro, and down to Beaumont. So that will have the best likelihood of severe weather. If we pull up a sounding in that area, and that is in the Houston area in the warm sector. And that is a very impressive photograph. Good zero through one kilometer shear, sweeping out a large SRH area. So the probabilistic hazard type going for marginal tornado. But the problem is going to be that limited instability. So when you look at moisture diagnostics like this, like the one kilometer chart, this is specific humidity and Got to keep in mind where those boundaries are in the lower levels. So all of this is going to be elevated moisture. 
and then further south, it's going to be more surface-based. And I would expect, even though the instability is not all that great, you really don't need much instability to get rotating storms. So there is certainly a threat for tomorrow in southeast Texas. And just a quick overview of weather around the country. Freeze warnings in southern Georgia, northern Florida, looking for upper 20s, places like Waycross, Gainesville, Albany, Tallahassee. In the central U.S., not very much going on, but in New Mexico, they are looking for the approach of that Pacific system. And we've got winter storm warnings and winter weather advisories in the mountains of northwestern New Mexico. Not including Albuquerque, but some of the passes in the Sangre de Cristos and the Sandia Mountains, things could be treacherous, possibly up to 8 to 14 inches of snow, mostly above, uh, I guess about, uh, I don't have the figures on that, but in Arizona, snow levels will be above 7,000 feet, could be 2 to 6 inches in the north rim area up here. In California, the Santa Ana winds have abated. You can see the pressures only range from 1024 in northern Nevada to about 1016 in the LA area. Not really enough to support that northeasterly wind, but that Pacific system is moving through and we do have gale warnings in effect in some parts of California and small craft advisories down the coast. Freeze warnings continue tonight for the Imperial Valley down to the lower 20s and the southern San Joaquin Valley could see upper 20s outside of Bakersfield and Fresno. In the northwestern U.S., some fog and an extensive amount of stratus in the Columbia River Basin, air stagnation alerts in effect, and some fog in the higher deserts and parts of the Bitterroot Mountains, especially around Spokane. Got some fog hanging around there. Atmospheric River starts up for Thursday night, tomorrow, and we're going to get a secondary push coming in for Saturday morning, which will be even stronger, and then a big surge for Saturday night into Sunday. Oregon, Washington, Northern California will all get hit around Wednesday with yet another surge, and all that moisture coming from the Western Pacific between Guam, the Philippines, and Japan. Heading up to Alaska, what do we got there? Gale warnings in the Gulf of Alaska with this wound up occlusion. Winter weather advisories in the eastern Kenai Peninsula right there for snow accumulations 10 to 16 inches. And a weak atmospheric river will be spiraling into southeastern Alaska tonight. IVT values about 300 there. And winter weather advisories are in effect for the Haines area located right there. They could see 3 to 5 inches of snow into Thursday tomorrow and winds up to 35 miles an hour. Elsewhere in Alaska, we do have winter weather advisories in parts of the Brooks Range. Looking at Ambler, Anaktuvik Pass, and the Dalton Highway Passes could be one inches of snow and blowing snow, causing some travel problems through there. Yeah, there is a road going through this area, believe it or not. In Canada, not much to report. We've got a surge of warm air coming through the Labrador Sea. Temperatures coming up to freezing across Baffin Island. That's very warm for this time of year. But Arctic air making its way down south. And this is a pattern that we see when the Hudson Bay low is active. Warm air coming up through the Labrador Sea and cold air coming down through the continental Canadian area. As we segue into the forecast, let's take a look at the jet stream. We do have a split flow pattern. There's the southern branch supporting that active weather system in the southwestern U.S., linking back up across the Atlantic, then a northern branch across Canada. Take a quick look at the patterns going into the weekend. Yeah, there's that Pacific Atmospheric River coming right into the Pacific Northwest. And you can see that the jet streams have kind of merged into a single stream out west. Meanwhile, across the eastern U.S., Looks like the subtropical jet and polar jet have coupled, and we're seeing 170 knot winds. So if you're flying from New York to California, probably looking at a longer flight than usual. As we go into next week, a more highly meridional pattern, really building up that ridge there. That's going to be a classic PNA type setup. 
another trough coming for the East Coast there, but things are progressing. That PNA quickly breaks down as the waves push to the east, and most of these weather disturbances affecting mostly the Great Lakes, the northern U.S., and the northwest. Not as much for the southern U.S., although this one trough here, that is really digging south. So that's coming up for maybe the 10th or 11th. Another round of rain possible for the Great Plains. So we're going to look at the GFS forecast with this chart. This is isobars and potential temperature. Potential temperature, that's basically just your isotherms reduced to sea level. That gives us a way of filtering out some of the effects of elevation. And what's important here is the gradients. Like right here, this indicates some sort of maybe a warm front coming off of the Rockies. This is for this morning. So let me bring that up to the current time. That's going to be evening, about the time you're watching this probably. Receding front heading on off towards Iowa. And I probably don't really have that drawn on there. I do see a thermal gradient, so maybe this placement wasn't exactly accurate because the temperatures, they do gradually rise all the way to the Dakotas. So maybe you can put a warm front somewhat like that and then up towards Montana. So there's a couple of different ways to approach this weather situation. In fact, yeah, 58 down in Kansas. Maybe something like that is a possible placement. So sometimes the more charts you go through, the more insight you get, and that's kind of the way it's supposed to work. All right, going into the overnight hours, the gradient really picks up there in Texas, building that warm air advection precipitation across East Texas. So it's going to start being a little bit rainy tonight. And then we've got that Pacific system starting to move through. Winds picking up in El Paso to Chihuahua. And then by midday, looking like this, probably the dry line getting established. And there's our front. That's going to be the warm front extending from about maybe uh, north of Abilene to the Houston area for evening. That other graphic we looked at earlier, the that was the uh, NAM, so it had a somewhat different solution. The Canadian air coming down, that's the boundary for that. But the Pacific air, that's not exactly obvious. All right, so I'll take you very quickly through the rest of the sequence. You can focus on your favorite area. Fast moving system coming out of Texas into the northeastern U.S. There it goes. Cold air flowing in behind, but not going very far south. Start to get that downslope reestablishing itself once again for this weekend from Amarillo up to Denver, Cheyenne. And then we get that Pacific system coming into Washington and Oregon. So the rain and snow begins for Saturday and Sunday. And that's going to be the end of that sequence. And once again, we head out to the San Antonio area. This is from yesterday. Some footage taken by Greg. So thank you very much for that. And also thank you to Brian Haggerty for the generous support for the program. And we'll see everybody back here once again for the Friday show. Hope you have a great evening. Take care. Bye-bye.